thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I'm Kevin from CircleCI. I'm the developer evangelist there. Um, we are big Docker fans, also a Heavybit alum, so much thanks to Heavybit for providing the space and returning us to our humble, humble roots. Um, I'm talking today about dev and test with Docker Compose. Um, I was talking to some of you before we started everything, and I gather that there are a good number of you that don't use Docker in production yet, so um, hopefully this will be like an interesting a uh, couple of use cases for using Docker in dev test environments before maybe you move on to using it in production. Um, yeah, so let's jump into it. There we go. Uh, okay, so yeah, like I said, just two quick examples, basically some quick stuff at the beginning, quick stuff at the end. Um, so yeah, a couple opening remarks. Uh, for one thing, I'm gonna, like I said, be talking about dev and test, but you can totally build your Docker containers on CircleCI. Uh, that thing about how um, ECS and whatever requires you to do your builds uh, elsewhere, you need to do your Docker build tooling, uh, that's us. We totally got your back there. So production builds, deployments of Docker, you can totally do. I'm going to be focusing on sort of dev and test for the talk. Um, also, these are kind of, I think, compared to um, last talk, my, mine is going to be a little bit more specific. But remember, these are just examples. And think about how they apply to your uh, unique situations. Um, I'm going to be kind of in the weeds a little bit, but uh, think about the, the, the general uh, examples. So, okay, first example is uh, service dependencies, specifically even just for de uh, development and test environments. Um, now, a quick show of hands, who here has had somebody join their development team and had to help them get their dev environment set up and been a little bit embarrassed about how difficult it was to get all the services coordinated and figured out? Right? Lots of, I, it's dark out there, so I'm going to just assume you all have your hands up because uh, we've all done it. Um, so if you have your Rails monolith or your Django monolith or whatever, maybe everything is in more or less one app. But since microservices are the way of the future, we're all you know, distributing uh, our app across many different services. Um, I think there was some mention of the, the Bezos two pizza rule. Uh, if you look at how many pizzas we've got back there, I think there's, there must be like 75 microservices floating around. So we've got a lot to, to coordinate. Um, so that's kind of a hassle to just get, up, get set up locally. So I'm going to do, uh, my first example is going to be about setting up like a local dev environment, just for example. Um, and this is a really simple case with just a database and a sort of data abstraction layer in front of that database for a identity service. Um, so I'm a new, I'm a developer, it's like my first day on the job, and I need to use the, the auth service uh, in my dev environment. Um, I'm going to jump right into a demo. Um, so, ugh. okay, so um, probably a normal way a lot of us have interacted with, you know, a database that we depend on locally is, um, is to just use, you know, our local, uh, also I didn't mention I'm going to be doing demos, um, so, you know, wish me luck and, and all that. <laughs> Uh, so we just have our local database, and we, uh, we have our, our local schema or whatever. And you can see I have a super robust uh, identity management system here with a whole table of, of users. Um, so that's great. And um, often, you know, that's enough. We're used to, to working with that. But because containers are the way of the future, we need a more robust uh, data abstraction layer on top of that, a service to sit in front of that so that we can then coordinate that uh, with other services like the, uh, the app I'm working on. Uh, that depends on this. So um, probably a lot of you have worked with uh, OAuth, LDAP, SAML, sort of standard identity provider uh, interfaces that would sort of sit in front of the database schema. Um, I'm going to be using uh, Cause as my uh, data abstraction layer, which is really a robust industry standard to provide a machine-readable format on top of identity information. Um, so that's great. Um, clearly a huge improvement from just the raw database connection, uh, which is a bad practice. But I'm still just using Cause directly. Uh, I don't have a robust HTTP API, and I'm not using containers. So we need to fix those things. Um, so first of all, to provide a uh, service layer, I have a really robust Python service. That's my uh, data abstraction layer uh, that you can see um, has some dependencies, like, like the Cause uh, program. It's got a lot of complexity that um, I need to manage to provide this service front end. Um, and this isn't my app. This is the service dependency, right? So it's clearly got a lot of complicated dependencies, like the Python standard library. That's a huge pain in the ass to, to set up. So we're going to uh, abstract all that away and put that in a container. Um, so that's where Docker Compose comes in. And I've got my uh, Docker Compose file for my, uh, for my 
service dependencies, uh, which comprises a Postgres database and PCA, which is the Postgres Kaose adapter. Um, so this one compose file uh, configures all of the dependent services for me. Um, even if it were just one thing, like Postgres, um, that could still be useful to run in Docker because maybe I've got some native extensions or some complicated configuration that is a pain to get set up on every developer's local environment. But when you get multiple different processes, I've got my Postgres database, I have the uh, service layer in front of that, uh, very industry-grade service layer in front of that, um, it gets more and more complicated to set up. So this is great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch that. And then when that boots up, um, we'll get to go back and we see our HTTP-based containerized API, um, which is just really robust and industry-grade and, re and ready to use uh, in production. So um, the next step, of course, is to wire this up to my client application, which is another uh, Python-based app. So I'll go to, go to that. This understands the, the uh, Kaose protocol um, and can refer to that for uh, identity management purposes. And you can see that now I have a nice uh, CLI on top of my uh, identity repository. And this is obviously a big improvement on top of uh, direct database access, which uh, just doesn't scale. So um, this looks great. This is obviously ready for production. But I know what you're all wondering is, how do we test this? So <laughs> I work for a continuous integration company. Of course, we're going to test this thing. So uh, I'll open our test. Uh, just a simple check that uh, we get the data that we expect out of our service dependency uh, through our client library. Um, and I'll just run that with nose tests. And it works, and it's great. Totally could run that on circle. Because we're strapped for time, I'm going to save the circle demo for later uh, for the next use case. So that is basic Docker Compose, uh, managing your service dependencies, setting up your dev environment for an industry-grade 21st century application. Um, getting back to the, the slideshow, that is a simple case of service dependencies. Uh, next, we're going to talk about a case where the difficult, annoying thing to set up is not your dependencies, but your tests themselves. Um, we at CircleCI see all kinds of tests uh, from all kinds of companies, all kinds of architectures. And um, you may have something that looks like this. You have your app collection of processes, your app system, and then you have your test stuff. And sometimes tests can be really uh, complex. They might involve multiple things coordinating. Uh, maybe there's some kind of uh, complicated load test or um, security sort of probing things. Um, but an actual common example of a relatively complicated thing is browser tests. Um, even these are actually uh, rather complicated with um, not only whatever your app requires, but also anytime you use something like Selenium WebDriver, that has its own uh, server endpoint that the Selenium test client then has to talk to to ultimately get anything to happen. And it can be a little bit complicated. So we're going to manage that complexity with, again, Docker Compose. Uh, so we've got uh, this app. Let's say I'm at the same company, and uh, this is a slightly more realistic uh, example of a application to be working on, um, as opposed to the, uh, the identity provider. Uh, so I'll show the, the get into the demo here. Um, in this case, I have a USG and Nginx-based Python app, like I showed. Um, which, again, is one of those things that would be annoying to sort of set up locally. But because I'm using Docker Compose, um, I can just launch that. Uh, and in just a couple seconds, that should be up. And let's see. Let's visit my cutting edge web page. Oh, look at that. And it's got these sweet JavaScript features with um, the latest HTML5 alert API. This is using uh, WebAssembly and um, uh, uh, React or something. And um, I had our designer. I'm sorry, product guys, but I, bar I borrowed a designer all day to work on this. Um, if you guys could like it on Dribbble, that would help me out a lot. 
Um, <laughs> so because I have all these sweet JavaScript features, I obviously needed to use a browser to test this. So um, <laughs> you guys, this is a serious software presentation. Let's maintain some composure. Um, so I have some browser tests to run, but browser tests can be kind of a pain. Um, often browser tests look something like this. This is just a little you know, snippet, obviously, but using a, a browser test framework, there's some little magic line of code like this one that's like, webdriver.go, do stuff. And what this actually usually does um, is something like find, uh, in the case of Chrome, where is the Chrome driver binary located, go find that, start that, which talks to Chrome, and spins up this server endpoint, and then your tests talk to that, and it's this whole thing. And we get all kinds of you know, uh, challenges on, I see nods from support engineers at CircleCI, <laughs> who, uh, where, where people um, use their favorite test tools, and they don't really actually get where the, you know, Chrome driver binary is located, and some test runners go find your Chrome driver binary for you and download it and install and figure it out for you, and it just gets kind of complicated. So another way that you can do it is, oops, uh, this is a, a actual complete test that uses a little more verbose mechanism to connect to the uh, browser with, it's a little, yeah, like, it's more verbose, but it's more explicit. It's saying, instead of go make me a Chrome, it's saying, here is the uh, Selenium API endpoint, talk to that, and it will provide, you know, the browser driving. Um, and this then, coupled with the Docker Compose file that goes with this app, which is uh, this, where you can see I have my, not only my app, my USB and Nginx processes, but also, a Chrome driver image, which is uh, Chrome, Chrome driver, um, X, uh, XVFB to provide an in-memory display, and all that stuff just Dockerized. And I found this on the internet. I did no work for this, thanks to Rob Cherry, apparently, and the Docker community <laughs> uh, for providing this. And uh, when I spin this up, oh, I already had it up. Look at that. Oh, I did that earlier to, to show the thing. Okay. Um, so you, you can see that, for example, if I go to the, uh, what is it, 4444. Um, I hard code all my, uh, my, my domain names. I think that's the best practice from the last presentation. Um, <laughs> so unknown command is just what uh, Selenium comes back with when there's no explicit API you know, command. But, but the point is that there is this endpoint that is explicit and we've created and it's just a little more visible and obvious. Um, so then I point to that for my browser tests and when I run my web driver browser tests. It passes, it takes like a second because it had to fire off a Chrome instance and all that stuff. But this is running Chrome in a Docker container with an in-memory display and all that stuff um, in a Linux machine in my local dev environment, which I can then uh, run the same way. Uh, what do I want to do? Okay, forget that. Git commit uh, allow empty. Touch. So I'm just going to make a dummy get push to trigger a circle build. And it kicks off pretty quickly. So this is now doing all that same stuff I did locally, just running it on circle. Um, it's starting up a Docker daemon within my circle container. Um, we don't have Docker Compose pre-installed yet, I guess we should soon, but so I have to download that. It takes like two seconds. Um, it pulls the Docker images. Um, does any builds if necessary. You can totally also do Docker builds. Um, there is some Python code in my project here too in addition to Docker, so it uh, spins up a virtual env environment and does a pip install and all that stuff to handle my Python dependencies. Um, Python dependency, or sorry, uh, just dependencies in general are cached in, this, in the circle cache. Uh, you can see now it's actually doing, there we go, Docker compose, build, pull, and waiting for everything to come up with a little wait script, sleep for five seconds, okay. Nose tests, and the actual test took no time, but um, you can see it did the same thing I did locally on CircleCI, it's kind of boring, honestly. But once this stops, um, one other cool thing on CircleCI, you can save uh, artifacts from uh, any build, which can basically be an arbitrary file. But once these are done getting collected, um, many of you might know that in a browser test, you can sort of often take uh, screenshots of things that happen in the app. Uh, so I have a handy screenshot of 
um, I guess via the in-memory display in the Linux uh, image in the Docker container, in the circle container, uh, in the on circle. That could be like a camp song, I think. Okay, closing thoughts. Um, so you might have noticed that I showed uh, the, the left image uh, core maps directly to what I showed, but the right image of here's my production stack, here's my test client stack, I want to wire those together and make them talk to each other. Um, I didn't actually do that. I just kind of shoved it all in one Docker Compose file. So that's one interesting question that I feel like we'll have some best practices emerge over the next you know, while. Maybe I'm not sure what the best way to do it is. Um, because it's kind of an interesting question of how do you take your production Docker sort of stacks and your development Docker stacks and your test stuff and wire it all together. Um, I'm sure there's smarter ways to do it than me. Um, ask some of the people with Docker t-shirts. But um, it's, a, I think, an interesting question that definitely affects how you organize your code, how you, you know, test it, and, and that kind of thing. Um, I know there are features in Docker Compose like extending, but um, I, I still think there's, um, it's definitely a matter of opinion probably what the best way to do it is. I just kind of picked one and for demonstration purposes. Um, so that's basically it. And then also, how do you just kind of connect together multiple Compose-based things? Because um, you know, four or five processes can maybe go in one Compose stack, but once you get like a bunch of those, how do you sort of manage it all? Um, I think even in, in dev and test environments, that's an interesting question. But um, the Docker people can tell us how to do it. That'll be fine. Uh, so all this code is online that I showed you. Um, I think that's it. Um, so thank you.